So um, part of this goes back all the way to my PhD that was uh, nearly 10 years ago. The image doesn't seem to want to load, but uh, that was a nanoparticle that I imaged back in my PhD days. <laughs> so yeah, if you look really, really carefully, it's there somewhere. But I, I worked on file-coated gold nanoparticles. Um, we did some TEM work, but back then it was only 2D. I couldn't look at tomography, and I didn't really have any concepts of this until we started collaborating a few years ago. So it's a, a new project. We, uh, we actually partnered with Cornell. Um, we, we went and gave a talk at Cornell about some of the open source work we did. And this was really born out of a need from our academic partners where they had a set of tools that were not satisfying their, their needs scientifically. They had some in-house solutions, but they wanted to develop something that was a little bit more fully fledged that could be used by the wider community. So we focused very much from the start on uh, how do we do 3D tomography for materials really well. Uh, how do we look at TEM microscopes? They're often aberration corrected, so they're quite high-end instruments. They're hard to work with. A lot of the collection is done very manually these days, and we're also trying to address that in some of the more recent work. But at the core, we wanted to go from a, an image stack that was collected on the transmission electron microscope. We wanted to be able to align the individual images. We wanted to then reconstruct those images into a 3D volume. And beyond that, we wanted to, to then use things like Python, NumPy, SciPy, to, to help with the analysis, to make this more of a fluid pipeline. So rather than giving you a fixed uh, end user application where you just hit the buttons and go, we wanted to give you starting points that were written in Python, but used the, the same stack that many of our users were already used to using, and then allow them to kind of go from fixed functionality to more of a research platform. Um, then the whole thing we record in a, an XML state file. So when you have a complex set of steps, we're able to step through each of those and see what you did at which point, and then even let you edit those steps so that you can go back and change your decision and see what you might do differently. And none of the image is going to load. <laughs> let me see if refresh works, just to give you a few pictures. There we go. So that was the nanoparticle. But I was excited because I got to see fringes, and this was 2004. It was a long time ago. So it was really exciting to kind of see the FCC packing in the nanoparticle. Um, but yeah, this is the Tomvis application. It's, uh, it's got multiple 3D views. By default, it just has one. We have a, a histogram where the, the user can effectively see the rough populations. Uh, and we're currently looking at just uh, single dimensional data. So we have a voxel data that's usually a short or an integer that's uh, straight from the readout on the, on the microscope. And then we have various controls along here where we can, we can look at visualization parameters and a, a pipeline that shows you what processing steps have been applied. One of the, the core goals for us was uh, to help the Cornell team go from a set of MATLAB scripts that were kind of developed in a very ad hoc way and be able to um, move from expert usage within their group to much wider dissemination. And also, uh, David Muller was very supportive of, of open science and looking at how do we take the experimental reconstruction routines and make them available to the wider community. And ideally, how do we help the research community contribute these to a central place where they can be tested, put up against one another, and ideally then put out so that end users can take advantage of the latest advances without them just being stuck in research papers. So the, the disadvantages there were the MATLAB license and a lot of scalability issues which we've been looking at. But uh, the biggest thing is really user friendliness and how do we get normal end users who don't necessarily know how to write MATLAB code to be able to use some of these reconstructions. So we looked at how we made a user friendly application, how we brought that to the masses. And the core technologies, uh, this is a, a kitware tool developed in several of our um, core technologies. So we, we use C++ for a lot of the core, a lot of the rendering. And then we wrap that in Python. And we also use a lot of native Python code. And we've made a pipeline that's very kind of Python centric. Um, we wanted to kind of give you, they, they were using, I think, four or five different software applications. So we wanted to be able to bring this into one single software application. But we didn't want to have to write everything from scratch. So we obviously wanted to reuse a lot of the open source components and package them into that. Then we wanted to um, make that tomography process reproducible. So we thought very hard about how we could facilitate that. So it wasn't just a one-off thing on your desktop. And we didn't want to make you have to manually note each of those steps. We use a permissive uh, free clause BSD license, so it, it can be reused everywhere, and the intent is to give you good working examples that can be even copied and pasted into your own work, but then give you the ability to contribute back without fear of lo uh, losing control. Um, we give you a, a 
cross-platform, self-contained installer, so you get everything in the one installer. You get the Python package, you get NumPy, SciPy, you get the whole desktop application, and they're all linked together and they're fully consistent, so you don't have to worry too much about installing other things on top, which is good, but also has its drawbacks. And at the core, it's, de it's designed to be a very interactive Viz tool. Uh, we use hardware execution, uh, hardware acceleration, sorry, so we use uh, GPUs, G GLSL to do the rendering. Some of the processes are actually done um, using GLSL. So we can uh, use volume rendering that's effectively most of it is executing on the graphics card when you have a high-end graphics card. And nearly everything in Python executes in a single background thread. Um, and if some of those things are multi-threaded, then they can take advantage of that. But at the very least, it doesn't lock the user interface. We're able to kind of keep running, let you modify the pipeline as things execute. So just to give you a very high level summary, um, we use CPU and GPU quite heavily. We need a fair bit of memory because these are often large volumes. It's still very much a desktop laptop based tool, so we're, we're aiming at kind of end user applications. We use BSD and we do most of the development on GitHub. And we use open languages and we've wanted to make sure that everything we do is, is accessible. So we have a lot of the open formats in the community. So there's TIFF and MRC that we're already widely used. We're working with Berkeley Lab on HDF5 standards to help get data in and out more, more quickly. Uh, it works on all the major platforms, and um, yeah, the whole thing is self-contained, and we have state files and pipelines to help you share those. To give you an idea, if you don't do tomography, and this was all brand new to me about three years ago, so I'm, I'm learning a lot, and I, I mostly know now. We, we have a sample stage in the TEM instrument. Usually they just take measurements flat, which is what I did in my PhD. What you can do in a t uh, tomography instrument setup is tilt this stage, uh, but you can only go to about 70 degrees plus or minus because then it becomes opaque to the electrons. So we have this huge missing wedge which presents unique challenges to TEM. And you also have a lot of movement in the stage because you're measuring things down at 10 nanometers, uh, 20 nanometers for the whole field of view. So a lot of very minor movements due to mechanical, um, yeah, mechanical motion you have to then account for in the processing afterwards. Once we've collected the data, we have a, an image stack, as we term it, and then we, we try to reconstruct that. So we need to realign all those images. And this works very much the same as most other forms of computer tomography. The major challenge is uh, how do we reconstruct with limited information? We, only of, we often have 50 to 70 uh, projection images from plus or minus 70 degrees. So we, we have a fair bit of missing information. So some of the research is looking at then how do you impose certain conditions and boundaries to help you get a good reconstruction with limited information? The, the core really goes back to uh, tomography is a, a set of complex steps that are interlinked. Many of the choices you make can affect the final reconstruction. And they were finding that they were not really able to address any deficiencies as well when they figured out three weeks later that they missed something in the middle because everything had to be repeated manually. So it was very hard to convince someone to go back and do this. And we wanted something that could automatically rerun these steps and, and actually compile them all into a state file. So they may need to rerun everything, but at least it can be done automatically without having a student fully engaged. So we, we've developed an automated software platform. We do everything from the point after collection, really. But we've done some initial work with collection as well to final visual images that you can look at on a computer and, and output into a paper. One of the bigger questions we've been asking more recently, and, and this came up right at the start, was if we record all these, can we actually start to publish these with the results and then give other people, such as reviewers, access to all of the data and let them actually fully review the reconstruction as well as the other things that are referred to in the paper? Technically, I think this is pretty much possible at this point. You can download the binary that's matched to the state file and you can look at exactly what the person looked at. And we would like to work with the community to see if this is something that they might consider doing in the future. This is really an overview of the steps that Tomviz um, addresses from experiment, which is very early work, and we're starting to do more and more of that right now, is actually interfacing with the instrument. But already in the application, we have all the steps for pre-processing the data, reconstructions, post-processing, visualization and analysis, and more recently, we've done a lot more with segmentation, which fits in somewhere there. We need to find a good spot to put that in the, in the diagram at some point. But the application itself, it's, um, it's built on Python as one of the cores, as well as uh, Paraview, VTK, for a lot of the visualization and the desktop tools. We use NumPy extensively. We use views in NumPy, so we avoid copies. Uh, we've done a fair bit of work trying to make that seamless. 
Um, and then we've also given you things like a Python editor that has syntax highlighting in the application. So you can edit this in a separate application that's, that's more suited, or you can use this lightweight editor, and you can at least get some of the niceties of um, editing code. And we're looking at um, adding other things. So when we're debugging these, people want line numbers. So there's a few other bits that have come up. But these are all open source Qt components. So they're built in the Qt um, stack, and, and we're able to kind of use these in the application to make the, the job of developing new algorithms easier. And often, if you see something in a pipeline that doesn't quite do what you want, you can double click on it and then open an editor, tweak the Python code, rerun it, and then instantly see the result in the visualization window. We also uh, more recently have ITK, so that I'll talk a little about that, but um, we have a few of the ITK developers in the audience as well, and they've done a, a lot of work with us to help integrate the wrapped ITK into our uh, Python pipeline. The application itself has, has three major building blocks, and, and these are all core components of our pipeline. So we have the data sources where we, we read from a file. More recently, we're starting to actually read from instruments as well. And then we have derived data. So this can be a reconstruction of a tilt series, and we're looking at how we can more fully express the connection between some of these components when they're derived from one another. We have label maps that come from segmentations as well, for example. And then we have operators. These execute in a background thread, and they operate on the data sources in one way or another. They often, um, many of them are written in Python, and we have about five or six that I think are also written in C++, but we can choose the language that's most appropriate. And we can build graphical interfaces for all these components too, so most file formats don't have any options. Some of them you need to tell it what the delimiter is or, or where, what type is in a raw file, for example. After that, we, we have modules, and these largely look at uh, how do we produce a visualizable artifact at the end of the day, and, and what do we do with the artifact? So we want to give you a contour, or we want to show you a volume rendering and let you control uh, the parameters around that. And all of these things, when you change the settings, are then encoded into that pipeline I was talking about. So a typical Python operator is um, presented in a dialog like this. Um, they're stored in our source tree, so we, we review them the same as the rest of the code on GitHub. But you can also just edit these things in line, and then um, ultimately when you're finished, you can save them to the source tree and submit a pull request as well. But they, um, they generally bring in some of the Tomviz helper utilities, and this just gives a mediation between the VTK data types that we have in the visualization pipeline, lets you bring them in as a NumPy array, takes care of shaping it properly for you, and then you can apply pretty much any, any operation you would apply on a NumPy array, which is the 3D volume that we're looking at in the visualization window. And right at the end, you can see uh, we set the array as an output. So we, we pass the final output as, um, as a, an array from NumPy that then gets converted back into the VTK world. And it's fairly seamless from the, the end user's point of view. To, to do all the mid-steps in just normal Python scripting. And, and the idea is that it's as easy as possible to, to go from a new algorithm to then something that's running in the GUI interactively. So we thought very hard about most grad students, most postdocs, they're not gonna get a full development environment set up, they're not gonna write C++, but many of them will happily tweak the Python code and they found the same with MATLAB. So we've developed uh, the most natural interface we, we can think of for, for doing things in NumPy and then using the tools that they're more familiar with, giving you a 3D array, which is always from the previous pipeline step, and you can see in the pipeline effectively what your inputs are going to be. We give you API that even lets you update progress. So if you know it's an iterative process, you can tell us that you're 20% of the way there, and we'll, so, we'll show that in a progress dialog in the UI. But you just set a member variable on the class to tell us you're 30% of the way through. We do the synchronization in the application. Uh, we've got an interactive operator, editor, and then um, we do translation to and from using views where possible. So we try and avoid copies because the data tends to be quite large. It can often be uh, 500 to a megabytes to a gig, gig and a half. Uh, we've done a lot of work on getting the memory management right, but uh, I think we've, we've pretty much got that there now as well. And we, we work on a destructive pipeline so we don't effectively blow up the size of our pipeline. So. Once you've run an operation, none of the intermediate steps are stored. So one of the obvious is disadvantages is that you then have to rerun the entire thing. So more recently, we've added some caching steps to make that a little easier. When you know if an operation takes three hours, you can mark that as a cached step and have a middle ground where you don't rerun everything. We can also set things like um, tables. So ITK can generate uh, summary statistics. For example, if we have nanoparticles, we have a filter that tells us the radii, the volume of the measured nanoparticles, um, and we can display those in a, in a standard uh, 
table. Oops. The pipeline is, is designed to be fully reproducible, so we've done a lot of work on um, how do we make sure that the file paths are relative? Um, how do we make sure that when you share this, nothing machine-specific is embedded in the file? Um, we want to really document the path from the raw data to that final image. And currently, I think most people just show the final image, and, and that's what we're trying to get away from with this application. And even when you write custom Python code, the, the actual custom Python code is saved into the same state file. So when you restore it, you see all of the custom additions and removals. One of the, the more recent discussions we've had is whether we might want to even diff those so you could see which lines were changed rather than um, showing just an entire different file. Because we, we, if it's changed, we assume it's entirely different and store the whole thing. We get access to many of the common file formats. We're adding more and more of those to the application. And then we make sure that all of the CPU intensive things are running in these background threads. But they're done in a, a very seamless way so that the actual Python developer doesn't have to worry too much about background threads and synchronization and other steps like that. It's done above the, the layer at which Python's being executed. These are a few examples of the research from Cornell. Um, a lot of the work they're doing there is um, looking at uh, fuel, cat fuel cell catalysts and then carbon supports. So we have uh, a fairly low contrast agent on which they sit and then high contrast. This was actually hand segmented. So this is one of the prime examples of why we want to try and make segmentation more fully available to material scientists. But they had a PhD student who's very talented, and he went through and spent, I think, days getting this just right. But he, he was able to tell which ones were on the inside and which were outside. And that dictates really the level of activity, um, depending on how you change the, um, the parameters by which you form these uh, fuel cell catalysts. It's very painstaking. We want to make that easy and trivial. In my PhD, I drew circles around, um, thank you, um, around nanoparticles, which was also amazingly manual and, and would have been automated easily these days. They, the group we collaborate with have been great, and they collaborate with others, but we have an open paper that was published by them using TomViz as one of the uh, software inputs. But it gives you tilt series and reconstructions and all the steps they used to get between the two, which is very unusual for the field. And one of the central pieces there was a, an open materials tomography tool to document how they went from one to the, to the final image. Um, some of the major innovations, um, we've been working on this for about three years, so we've been able to kind of achieve a fair few things over those uh, three years. We've got the background execution, we've got a um, Python native pipeline, so we're able to expose a lot of the, the scientific Python stack, and we're looking at other pieces we might want to bring in. We take advantage of the volume rendering that's in VTK. We've used some of the latest innovations that were funded by the NAH to uh, really accelerate the rendering. Something called flying edges, which is faster than uh, marching cubes to take advantage of sparse data so we can do interactive contouring, which is an order of magnitude faster than the marching cubes because it does early termination. And we've also got a very focused and intuitive application that uh, isn't overly complex for experimentalists. One of the nice things we've done very recently, still very experimental, is um, we do export images and movies, but we've got an interactive HTML5 export function. So you can share a 3D model that you've processed in, uh, with people. This is an example of uh, two views of the same piece of data, for example. So we have an ISO surface, and then we have a volume rendering. And you can see it's a very dense core because we're using maximum intensity to really accentuate the core of this material. Um, yeah, it's, it's very much optimized for tomography, so I've, I've said many of these things, but we have a combined histogram of opacity color map at the top, which helps you manipulate the parameters for volume rendering. And the, the final thing here is uh, segmentation. We, we've worked with ITK and we've worked with a few of the people in that project. We want to give a turnkey solution for segmentation, so when you have a fairly standard problem, we want to make it very easy to then segment these final images. Oh and make it easy to go from qualitative analysis to more quantitative analyses, and, and how do we do that in an intuitive uh, end-user application? So we're thinking a lot about that, and this is all done using the Python wrapping in, in the scientific Python stack. Uh, for development, we, we have a main site at tomviz.org. Uh, we do all of the development on GitHub. We use pull requests and code review in the public. We use issues. We've done this right from the start of the project. Uh, they're signed releases, so we use PGP. And we use DOI generation, so we got the Zenodo integra integration. Um, automated software quality dashboards, so we're able to then test the latest merge code and then give you an installer to, to test. All the kind of standard files to try and help you get introduced to the project. Super build that um, coordinates how we build the, the bigger project. 
And then we use continuous integration. So we're able to use Travis to run things like Clang Format to tell you for a formatting issues instantly. We use CircleCI for our Linux builds and AppVeyor for every pull request that we make. Um, next is to try and figure out OpenGL in a CI in a very limited environment. So we, I think I'll talk with JC and a few others about what they're doing there. Um, Superbuild, we use CMake to do this Superbuild packaging type concepts. And we've been able to really kind of uh, give you all of the things that we need in one super build that coordinates many other smaller builds to then give you a full binary package that we can generate uh, using a CMake and CPAC to make these installers. And at the end of the day, we give you a pretty DMG or MSI installer for Windows and a TarGZ for, for Linux. So you can then just drag and drop this anywhere you want. It's fully relocatable, so it can live in your home directory or um, you can install it into a system location. Uh, big challenges that we hit along the way, not all of these we expected. So SciPy needed things like Intel Fortran in order to compile on Windows uh, with MSVC. Thank you. Um, so I'll try and wrap up now. And then multi-threading uh, is, is tough. NumPy views and memory management is, is challenging. But uh, I'll just give you a quick summary of where next. So we, we heard in the last month that we got a phase 2B funding from the Department of Energy. We we're actually collaborating with the same person, but now he's an assistant professor at um, the University of Michigan. Uh, so it's Rob Hovden, who is a postdoc at Cornell. But we want to extend to other types of tomography, make this more of a general tool, and then um, look at the advanced pipeline. How can we run things in separate processes, maybe use Docker, um, cloud and HPC resources. But we have a, a fantastic development team. I, I can't thank them enough for all the work they've done. Um, we've also been very well supported by the Department of Energy with uh, funding to, to work on this. We get to work with experimental equipment. This is a TEM microscope that I, I love getting back to a little because I get a little bored of just playing on computers all the time. We've done data acquisition with NSEM more recently. And then we host things like hackathons to try and make progress more rapidly. And in the end, we produce these uh, beautiful images that really kind of illustrate science at the nanoscale and help people illuminate things at very low length scales. Thank you.